When my daughter Tabitha first spoke, I was ecstatic, and so was my wife. I was getting worried as she'd hit that age, and every day that passed, and she didn't, she didn't speak. It was, it was one more day of anxiety. Fast forward three and a half years, and it was my job to explain to Tabitha what had happened to her mother. I'd left it for a few days, not knowing how to explain it. I'd been psyching myself up, but I couldn't do that to her. See, I couldn't tell. I couldn't tell her that her mother was gone. So on a quiet evening, I sat with her watching TV. She said, "Can Erica stay?" Who? I asked. She pointed to her right, to the empty space on the floor next to her. It was a reflection of my own childhood, and a tingle of fear crept up my back, like wayward hands going for the throat. I smiled back at her, if only the only person I knew that could help. My sister Tammy wasn't loved by my mother. Um, I didn't understand that at the time. My father had been in a car accident. He had been driving back from work late. I remember the days that Mom and Dad argued, her asking if he could do less hours. He said he needed to do them, that there would be no one else who could. Now my dad loved Tammy, even more than me, I think. He didn't like that she slept on the floor next to my bed, but Mom insisted. I'm not getting that thing a bed, my mom said once, so loud that I could hear it through the floor. I cut my hands over Tammy's ears and whispered to her that everything would be fine. He'd fallen asleep and drifted off the motorway. They speculated that he woke when he hit the rumble strips on the side of that、uh, hard shoulder. There were sixty feet of skid marks that weaved from left to right until his vehicle lost all momentum instantly. We didn't see Dad after that. Mom didn't tell us to start with. I guess she thought knowing the truth would somehow make life worse. We couldn't heal. We couldn't move on. Mom took it out on Tammy. Make your sister behave, she'd say. I don't want to see her in this house, she demanded. Keep her in your room. She disgusts me. Without Dad there to defend her, and me only thirteen years old, I kept quiet. I'd known about her anger. I, it didn't take me long to figure out Dad wasn't coming back. The rumors spread quickly at school. Within, within days, children were asking what it was not to have a dad. I told them that he was coming back, though they just laughed. Then they stopped teasing, and a teacher explained to me what had happened. I was numb. He was on a work trip. My mother said. She said he'd be back. I felt like an idiot. I was thirteen. I didn't know what death was. It reminded me of when I was in in year ten, and thunder growled above the school fields. It began to run inside before my friend Darren said that there was nothing to worry about. It was only clouds bumping together. We laughed at him like they laughed at me. I didn't understand how hurtful it must have been to him, but this was about my dad, and my sister was the only person who showed any sign of sympathy because we shared it. Tammy was upset. She told me that she felt so lonely. She asked if, if she wished hard enough, would he come back?、I、told her it wasn't possible. Why? It doesn't work like that. I said. I could see the tears well up in her eyes. Maybe though, if you try really hard, I said. And she smiled. That was all I wanted—a smile. Selfishly, though, as I could worry less about her and concentrate more on my own grief. Mom screamed one morning and thumped up the stairs. Tammy jumped off the bed. She didn't want Mom to catch her sleeping on the mattress. She had to sleep on the floor. She shuffled under the bed with practice. Who did this? Mom blasted, pushing her way into the room so hard I thought the door would fly off the hinges. She dangled the bloody carcass of our, of our pet rabbit, Peter. I、uh, remember how its eyes were still open with fright. Its white fur spotted with flecks of blood. I didn't do it. I swear, I said. Who was it then? She said quicker. A vein throbbed in her forehead, as if it were the thing demanding answers. Was it your sister? Where is it? It was me, I said. 
not wanting her to hurt Tammy. I shut my eyes and I braced myself, feeling my body grow stiff and the tension almost shattered me. When I opened my eyes, Mom was gone. Moments later, Tammy edged herself out from under the bed, her eyes red from tears. I'm not mad, I said, but why did you do it? It wasn't me, it was Bobby. Who's Bobby? He's my friend. I looked around the room, seeing no one. Is, is he here now? She was now kneeling on the makeshift bed next to mine. She nodded. Where is he? She pointed to the closet. I hopped off the bed and made my way over. I need to talk to him. Is, is that okay? No! He doesn't like other people. Only me. The cupboard had those slatwood doors, so I tried to peer in to see if any eyes shined back at me. If he's in there, how did he kill Peter? We were downstairs. He didn't mean to, Tammy pleaded. He tried to hug him, and Peter started kicking. He was only trying to calm him. I wanted to tell Tammy that Bobby wasn't real, that it must have been her that did it. I couldn't do that to her so soon after losing Dad. I think it's best that you stay up here. I'll go talk to Mom, I said. In the weeks following my father's death, it felt as though I was forced to grow up. It was my job, no, it was my duty, to look after Tammy and to keep my mom away from her. It wasn't her fault that Dad was dead. When I got downstairs, Mom sat at the dining room table with a glass of red wine. Peter lay in the center of the table. What am I supposed to do with this? She asked calmly. I don't know, Mom. It wasn't you, was it? She stated. Yes, it was. Stop lying for her! I'm not. I can tell you're lying. I'm your mother. I hung my head. Please don't hurt her, I pleaded. She scoffed. What use would that do? I don't know what you did, but your dad... She trailed off. I don't know what you mean. Killing an animal is serious. Shows there's something wrong with her. Don't you see that? I shook my head. Jesus, it's not hard. She picked up Peter and shook him. I could see that she saw the grimace I pulled. Killing animals is wrong. I should have kept my mouth shut, but it was my duty. It was my duty to protect Tammy. We eat meat every day. I saw her face go red. She didn't explode. She didn't say anything. But you should go to school. I'm hungry. We have rabbit. Can't let that go to waste. I went to school without eating. Over the next few days, I smelled something odd in my bedroom. First, it smelled sweet. Then it disappeared. Then the next day, rotten. Tammy was playing on the floor when I approached the closet. Through the wood slats, I smelt it. It was coming from in there. I reached for the handle. Don't go in there. Bobby won't like it, Tammy said. Can you smell that? Yeah, huh? It's disgusting. Bobby wanted to play with Peter. What? He's dead. Bobby doesn't know that. I pulled the closet door open and flies flew out. I shielded my face. No, Tammy pleaded. There was nothing in there. Except for the decomposing corpse of Peter Rabbit. I heaved. Get me a bag. Bobby says to leave it. He, he's telling him he's sorry. Bobby, is it real? I shouted. And as soon as I did, I regretted it. Tammy stood up and ran out of the room. Luckily, it was Thursday and Mom had already put out the bins to the curb. When I heard Mom go to bed, I gave myself half an hour before I crept downstairs and outside, placing Peter into the bin. Goodbye, buddy, I said. And for the first time in weeks, I felt myself begin to cry. Then I thought about Dad, and all the grief I'd been storing up flowed out. It's one of those silent cries. Well, you don't want anyone to know. I stopped when I turned back to the house. 
The light was still on in my room and I could see Tammy stare out watching me. I didn't want her to see that. Next to her, a silhouette around a foot taller than her. When I returned to the bedroom, Tammy was already tucked in. I didn't undress when I got into bed. I was scared. I saw Bobby, I said with the covers pulled over my head. Yes, you did, Tammy replied. I told you he's real. I realized I had no place to be arguing with her. Where is he now? He said he didn't want to go back into the closet. I felt my breathing quicken as a fright I didn't know possible began to take hold. Where is he, Tammy? He's under your bed. I felt myself hyperventilate. A hand touched my shoulder. I pulled back the covers to reveal Tammy's smiling face next to me. Don't worry. He likes you. I didn't see Bobby up close then. Tammy said he was shy, and I was happy about that. I put it down to a hallucination, a trick of the light, lack of sleep, stress, grief. The list was endless. It was rare to see Mom without a glass of wine after the rabbit incident. I'm sure she was grieving the loss of our dad, but that was the tipping point. I think he was the only thing keeping the family together, and with her irrational hatred of my sister, she was gone. Lost in alcohol. Mom no longer picked me up from football practice, so I stopped going. I wasn't too bothered. There was a, a divide between me and the other players after Dad died. They treated me as the kid without a father. Instead of giving me support, they kept me away with jokes and jibes. On the day it all changed, I knew something was wrong. The front door was wide open. I could see it from down the street. I walked normally, then quicker again as something inside of me knew. It was odd. The house felt cold. It was as if the life inside had been snuffed out. Who are you? I asked the man who stood in the living room. He was around six feet tall, wearing a black sweater, black gloves, and a balaclava that covered his face. Rucksack sat on the floor next to him. I didn't do it, he said, his voice wavering. I swear. He pushed past me, setting me tumbling to the floor. I didn't see where he went. My eyes were concentrated on the trail of blood that ran to the kitchen. I didn't want to get up at first. I knew if I did, I'd follow the tracks and find out what it was. Mom? I shouted, hoping to hear a response. Tammy? I shouted again. I heard crying. I pushed myself to my feet, feeling my legs give way. As the anxiety of the situation took hold, I remembered my heart thumping so hard in my chest that it was, it was as if it spoke to me, saying, uh-oh, 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 uh-oh. As I approached the kitchen, I saw Tammy first. She was standing. Still in her nightgown, her hands over her mouth as if to keep out the scene. She stared out in front of her. She saw me. He didn't mean to hurt her. He was trying to protect her from the man. Who, Tammy? Who did this? Bobby, she said, and then burst into tears. On the floor, a small glass leaked a puddle of Charlotte wine. And mixed with the blood that ran from my mother. Mom, I said running and slipping on the liquid. Phone the ambulance! Tammy was frozen on the spot with her fear. I heard creaks from upstairs and Tammy's eyes met mine. I knew who it was. I reached for the kitchen phone and I, I called on the line and hugged my mother. I expected her body to get colder, but it didn't. I placed my ear to her chest, hoping to hear a pulse. I didn't cry. I felt numb. They didn't tell me what happened to my mother. Only that she was brave. And she confronted an intruder that I should have... That I should be proud of her. I was taken to live with my aunt and uncle. When I asked them where Tammy was, they were always nice. They said they only ever heard good things about her. But she had gone to stay with another family. When I asked why, they didn't give me an answer. When I asked if I could talk to her, they said someday. But not today. It was only when I turned 24 when I found her again. I moved out as soon as I could, age 17. It wasn't that my aunt and uncle weren't nice people. I mean, they were. But it never felt like home. 
I always felt like if I were biding my time until I could get out. I tried so hard to find her through Facebook and other family members. Those who did remember her remembered her as a very young child, had no clue as to where she was. When I finally saw her, I was sitting in a cafe drinking coffee. As she was outside, she walked hand in hand with the man I thought I recognized. I raced out and she spotted me instantly and greeted me with a powerful embrace. She introduced me to her boyfriend, Robert. He was older than me, around 10 years. I thought it was good that she had an older boyfriend. She needed someone who could be a quasi-father figure to her. Do I know you? I said, as I took his hand. I don't think we've met before, he said, shaking my hand. We exchanged information. And kept in touch. I was anxious before she answered the phone. And when she did, she was too. I asked her how her day was, and she seemed preoccupied. What's wrong? I asked. I knew you were going to phone. I told Robert. He's looking at me in the way that you used to look at me. Remember when we were kids? You let me sleep in your bed? You always made me feel so safe. I do. We were both quiet for a moment. Spit it out, she responded. It's Tabitha. How's she getting on? She's fine, um, but she mentioned something today that reminded me of you. Oh? Yeah, she's got this friend. That's nice. It's always good to have friends. No, no, she's, um, she's not real. And I sighed, remembering telling Tammy about Bobby. She says her name is Erica, I continued. Is she happy? Yeah. So what's the problem? I don't want to have her, you know, have to cope with grief with an imaginary friend. Have you not told her what happened? I hadn't. How could I? How could I tell my child what happened to her mother? I could barely face it myself. No. You really should. It would help so much. I will do, but... What should I do in the meantime? Play along? Work for you? It didn't. I told you Bobby didn't exist, but you insisted. She let out an anxious laugh. And you remember how that ended? When someone wants something so badly, but people don't accept it. You can't stop it. Your anger only fuels it. What's created isn't wanted. I don't understand. Oh, honey... I love you so much. You looked out for me much longer than you needed to. What do you mean? You and Dad couldn't let go. The love you felt for me was so consuming you forgot about it completely. Mom didn't. She grieved. She let go. Why do you think it was so hard for her to see me around the house? The room began to spin as a memory I knew I had that had pushed away to the darkest reaches of my mind, tucked away under the bed and forgotten about, came to the surface. You remember, don't you? Tammy said with a melancholia to her voice. I did. You were in the bath. It wasn't Dad's fault. It was my heart. The whole thing flashed before my eyes. Dad running out of the bathroom screaming, Mom asking what was wrong, me walking into the bathroom to see Tammy's body float face down in the bath. Dad telling me that everything was going to be okay. Tammy was only going to the hospital for the night. She'd be back in the morning. You came back, though. Dad and I greeted you at the door. I did. I don't understand. You and Dad wanted me back so much. I'm going to have to go now. Please don't, I pleaded with Tammy. I have to. It's time. I love you. I love you too, big brother. The static hiss took over the phone line. It was replaced with a dial tone. Frantically, I punched in the numbers again. I wanted to hear it ring, but instead it was just... I was just greeted with, I'm sorry, this number is no longer in service. I sat next to Tabitha as she was, she was saying how much fun she was going to have with Erica. She asked if she could stay for the weekend. I took a deep breath and I said, I'm sorry. 
Sorry, she can't. I need to tell you something about your mommy. When is she coming home? She asked. Yeah. It's about that. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and thank you for watching tonight's video. I want to talk to you about one quick thing uh, before we get into the real outro here, uh, and that's going to be the Australian fires that are currently taking place. Uh, I'm pretty sure everybody has seen on their social media or on the news or what have you about what's taking place in Australia right now. The fires are raging out of control. There's something like 1.5 million acres that are currently on fire. It's pushing animals towards extinction, forcing people out of their homes. Many of them YouTubers and other uh, creepypasta narrators um, that you probably listen to here. Um, but one thing that actually kind of gets to me is that there's there's a lot of awareness about what's taking place down there. There's a lot of photos and videos I'm pretty sure that you've all seen, but nobody's really talking about where you can go to to be able to donate, uh, to be able to help um, either firefighters or relief funds or anything like that. And that's what I want to try to bring to you guys, or at least have you guys try to share around, even if you're not able to donate. If you look in the description down below, there's four different links there uh, that I'm going to have on the videos for the next couple of weeks. Um, and hopefully we can, and we, I mean... <laughs> all of you uh, can be able to um, share this around and all of us together can be able to actually get some more eyes on where we can be able to go to help. I mean, yeah, we're a group of people that like horror stories, horror movies, horror, what have you. But um, I think one thing we can do that's at least powerful for us is we have the ability to minimize the amount of horror in real life. Oh, uh, so thank you guys so much for watching or listening. If you're listening to this on the podcast available on Spotify and on Apple and on SoundCloud and on Google or wherever you get your podcasts from, or if you're listening on the podcast, then thank you for watching on YouTube and subscribing to Mr. Creepypasta. And a very big thank you to my patrons from patreon.com slash Mr. Creepypasta, such as Dr. Strawberry, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Chumpinski. Brianna Ventine Jensen, Stephanie Van Huss, Tristan Pelton, G Weevil 3, Diane Krause, Asia, the Red Oak Shield Virus, Sandy Barney, Nico Kyle, Caleb Dugall, Daniel Polson, Dante Rao, The Last Blade Song, The Ginger Bros, Don Mewmeister, Eliminator 86, Nebsky, Sky Harbor, Finley, Steampunk Center, Rafael Rodriguez, and Optimistic Avocado. You guys are the MVPs and everybody down there in the description. A big thank you to you guys as well. Sweet dreams, everybody.